Today on the Transplant Helper, I wanted to pause for just a moment and tell my story in my own words. Hit the subscribe button and the bell notification to become part of the Transplant Helper community. Hey folks, welcome back to the Transplant Helper again today. My name is Jim Merle, and I've had a number of people most recently, after watching many of my programs entitled My Story, My Words, basically come back and say, Jim, what in the world is your story? What has your journey been like? How did you get started with transplant? And how did you arrive where you are right now? And I, I have shared that here on the program before. As a matter of fact, incrementally throughout the years, I'm sure I've shared the majority, if not all of my story, just in bits and pieces scattered in different programs. But as far as sitting down and gathering all that up and trying to tell it in a very you know, typical way, like I've done these interviews with these other people, I haven't actually done that yet. So I thought it'd be a good idea to do that and to do it using exactly the same format I've used with everyone else. And that is by basically asking the same six questions of myself that I've been asking everyone else. So the very first question I ask everyone is this, tell us a little bit about yourself and your family slash caregiver. Well, my name is Jim Merle. I was born on March the 12th, 1975, and I was born with a congenital heart defect known as transposition of the great vessels. Now, I had a corrective surgery at about six months old, roughly, September the 30th, 1975. I had a corrective surgery at six months old, known as the mustard procedure, which at the time was one of the better options they had for trying to patchwork and treat transposition of the great vessel slash arteries. But uh, that surgery was not assumed to be something that was going to go very smoothly. As a matter of fact, I was taken into surgery at that six months mark as the youngest baby in the state of Alabama ever to have full open heart surgery. In addition to that, my parents were giving a very slim chance that I was going to survive the surgery. And it was actually assumed that if and when I survived, I probably wouldn't make it out of childhood. So they were just kind of doing the best they can with the technology of the time. So that was me at birth. Now, fast forward in life many, many years, I eventually met my high school sweetheart, determined that I would marry her. And at the point of my transplant at least, we had two children. Uh, both of them were wonderful blessings to my life, but we always knew that we wanted more. Now, I became ill and my wife eventually became my primary caregiver. So Jennifer Merle is absolutely my hero in life. She pretty much has done anything and everything for me throughout the years, coupled with a few other family members, particularly my parents and such. And they've made life possible. So I have a wonderful family, an outstanding caregiver in my hero, Jennifer. And that's basically who I am. In a nutshell, in the short version, that's at least who I was. Now, since heart transplant, which I'm going to tell you about in just a few moments, my life has totally changed. Things are just so much different. My family uh, makeup is different. Everything is different than it used to be. And I'll probably share that as we go through. So that's the first question covered. Now, the second question, how were you first introduced to transplant? That is what caused me to need a transplant. Well, I just told you a little bit about that. It basically comes down to me being, to me being born with that congenital heart defect, transposition of the great vessels, TVA as some refer to it, or great arteries. Um, that was a condition that for me at least, it was not a survivable condition. It basically meant that my heart was transposed, and that is the larger chamber of the heart was trying to basically just only go to my lungs. The smaller chamber of my heart that was supposed to be going to my lungs was trying to supply my body with blood. Couple that with a couple of different holes that I had in between the walls of my, the inside walls of my heart. I just wasn't going to make it. I was referred to as what is called a blue baby, and that is because I would basically go into a cardiac arrest, at least lose my ability to keep oxygen supplied through my body. And it was a very, very scary time for my family, particularly for my parents. Uh, at that point in time, there were very few people, including my grandparents, really, that wanted to spend an awful lot of time with me. They loved me, certainly, but no one wanted to be holding that blue baby if and when the time came that he wasn't going to survive in that particular episode of that particular problem. So I was sort of kind of introduced to transplant way back in 1975. Not that it was on the table then, but it was kind of a thing that came in the first few years after that if and when he survives childhood, if and when he makes it on to adulthood, then there's a potential out there at least that transplant could be his only option. Now, fast forward 32 years, very roughly, 
32 years, up in about April of 2009, I had always been told by my pediatric cardiologist, which I'd followed up with year after year all through those 32 years, I'd always been told by my pediatric cardiologist that there would be a day, there would be a time when there would need to be something major done. There would be some major bumps in the road. I would have issues, which they often described as beginning with some heart rhythm problems. They said it would probably go from there to having some actual uh, heart failure problems and so forth and they predicted very right it was around april of 2009 i was standing in the kitchen looking out my kitchen window there beside my wife we had friends that were coming over for supper that night and as i'm standing there looking outside maybe the children were outside i can't remember that part but just looking out the kitchen window my wife noticed me reaching up and kind of feeling on my neck. What I was doing at that moment at least was feeling for my pulse. It turns out, as she began to look at me and notice I looked a little different, it turns out that my heart was skipping beats. And as a matter of fact, more than skipping beats, it was taking pauses, long pauses. It would kind of beat hard a time or two, and then it would just kind of go flat for a little bit. I wouldn't feel any pulse at all. I'd still be at myself. I'd still be awake. I wasn't in any type of pain, but my heart would just continue to stop and start over and over again, I could feel that. I could sense that. I could feel those strong beats and I could feel when things just weren't right. So immediately, you know, we called over some family friends to come and take care of our two children at the time. Uh, my wife rushed me to the local emergency room. We called our friends, told them supper was seemingly canceled, uh, but still didn't really know if anything major was going on, if it was really a big deal. Now, I went on over to the a local hospital there, was taken in the ER pretty quickly. You know, they start talking about heart problems or chest pain. They'll usually get you back pretty quick. They got me back there and put me on a heart monitor. And lo and behold, just what I was feeling with my hand was absolutely true. You could see on the monitor there, my heart would beat and beat and it would be kind of irregular. And then suddenly it was kind of flatline. And it was, it was crazy strange. As a matter of fact, one of our friends came over rushed over to the hospital instead of coming to our house he came back to see me just to just to say hey and when he saw it flatline and i'm continuing to carry on a conversation with him uh it it panicked him <laughs> he said i can't take it i'm going back out in the lobby to wait and uh they got in touch immediately though with my what would become my transplant center had always been my lifelong uh cardiac hospital uab they got in touch with them and took some advice back and forth and basically said, look, well, we don't want to touch him here in the local hospital. We would rather he be under your care. So what can we do about that? Well, UAB ordered them to do an echocardiogram slash an EKG. And the EKG they had in that little, we call it the Band-Aid Station Hospital, was only a four lead. UAB needed a 12 lead to really get some information. Since they didn't have that, they said, forget it. Uh, we'll just send you on over to UAB. So that is basically where I got my big start. That is April of 2009. Fast forward over the next few months, I would be back and forth in UAB Hospital. They began to notice more and more issues. My pediatric cardiologist did his own examinations of me and said, yeah, seems like he's in pretty severe heart failure. He's going to need a lot of assistance in the next several months or even year if he's going to survive this. That included an ICD, that included many other things which were not expected at the time, but eventually the word transplant came out. I'd actually been taken into a cath lab that day. I, I don't even have the date on this, but I was taken into the cath lab that day. I think it was in 2010. But taken in the cath lab that day, it was told to my wife and family, hey, he'll be in the cath lab and out in about 45 minutes, no big deal. Four to five hours later, I finally came out of the cath lab. They had tried repeated to, repeatedly to balloon some narrowed areas, and they basically came to the conclusion they weren't going to be able to do anything. There were no stents that could be involved. There was nothing that they could be done about it. Uh, they came and woke me up after surgery, got me back in the room, and about the first words I heard uttered were, Jim, you're going to need a heart transplant. And it was it was... It knocked my socks off, okay? I was not prepared for that. I went into the hospital that day assuming, you know, we were going to be in and out. Things were hunky-dory. I'd be fine. Didn't know why I was having issues, why I was fatigued, why I was tired. But I just assumed they're going to fix it. They said that day they weren't going to fix it, that there was nothing they could do short of transplant in order to, you know, to get me to be any better off. So that's kind of how I was first introduced to it. Now, the next question I typically ask people then was, you know, how long was your wait? Well, my wait for transplant, and you're not going to believe this, 
My weight for transplant, at least the way I see it, probably went in the neighborhood of about five to six years. Now, it wasn't listed. Please don't misunderstand me. I was not listed for transplant for that entire period. But from the first time I heard the word transplant mentioned alongside of my name, up until the point I received the transplant itself was probably about a five or six year period. Uh, I went through the transplant evaluation process four times, and I've got an entire video series about that evaluation. Particularly one of the main videos is about how grueling that transplant evaluation can be, how difficult and trying it can be on your body, on your emotions, on your mind. You know, just everything about you can kind of get thrown off kilter during that evaluation. And uh, I went through that four different times. Each of the first three times, I was told, basically, you're so borderline. We don't know exactly whether or not we need to transplant you now, or at least put me on the list to be transplanted now, or where we can wait. We don't know what the what the outlook is on this. Now, the difficulty was that when they would take me in for the cats and the cath labs, when they would take me back for the echoes and the EKGs and all these battery tests, pulmonary function tests and such, again, I kept coming up borderline. But the problem is, being that I was a congenital patient, they couldn't trust the numbers. They said, these numbers look horrible. Uh, you shouldn't even be walking. You shouldn't even be able to function. But the truth was, on every one of those occasions, I had walked myself into the doctor or into the hospital, whatever it was. I had walked right in, and I was continuing generally to function in life. Now, I was getting weaker. And as the doctors followed me through those several years, they noticed that on paper in the labs, but I also noticed that physically. I got to a point in life where I was basically sleeping 16 to 18 hours a day, pretty much doing anything with my two children at that point in time as far as playing in the yard. That was all shot. If it had not been for the fact that I had a wonderful family and support system and, and great neighbors at that time that physically lived across the street from me, there actually was a man that would come across the road, just a, just a single fresh out of college guy owned a local business. He would come across the road every day and basically throw the football on my kids or play soccer or kickball or something like that. I would sit on the porch and watch. He just, you know, he, he wanted to help. He, he wanted to do anything. He would cut our grass. He would come and play with the kids sometimes. He just did a lot. Great, world's greatest neighbor as far as I'm concerned. But I didn't have the energy. I didn't have the stamina for that. So in a sense, I would say I waited for five years, something like that. But the truth is, as far as me being technically placed on the list, it was at that point of that fourth evaluation, again, evaluated three times, where the doctors weren't sure if it was the right move. On the fourth evaluation, they decided to list me for transplant. And I was listed at that time as what is known then, at least, as a status 1B. That basically is the top tier, but just a smidge lower. Back then, to be a status 1A or at the very top, you had to be in the hospital full time on all kind of drips and assistive type devices. Uh, to be a 1B, however, you just you could wait at home. You were on a, on a medication for me was milrinone. Basically, any of these IV 24/7 medications, you could wait at home with those and still be last listed as a 1B. Now, if you want to compare that to current statuses, basically right now, the status system has changed since that, but basically right now, a status 1B would be equal to about a status 3 or 4, okay, depending on how they scale those things out. But anyway, I was listed as a status 1B, and I was technically on the transplant list for 265 days, so about 10 months uh, out of that four to five year from the time of hearing it till the time of getting it type of thing. So I was listed for 265 days. During that period, I was on that 24-7 IV milrinone pump, you know, everywhere I went, everything I did, which I was able to still go a little bit. Home health nurse helped me to, to, to navigate those things, especially my transplant center was great during that time. But, you know, I was very limited in what I could do. One, because I was sleeping a lot. But two, when you're kind of tethered to an IV bag, mine was in a fanny pack, so a little bit more portable. But there's just not a lot that you can do, <laughs> particularly with a pick line in my arm. There just wasn't a lot I could do as far as, you know, even taking a good high quality shower <laughs> was difficult. But 265 days is how long I was listed. So my story boiled out from that point that finally, after about that 10 months had, had gone to its max, 
I went in the clinic for a general checkup. Again, still on the IV miller and on. Had had several bumps in the road, including a pick line having to be replaced because of a terrible infection. Another story for another day. I almost died at that point. But I went in the clinic for a typical visit that day. As a matter of fact, my family and I had plans. I was going to go into clinic that morning, do all my tests and follow-ups, and then I was going to head on out. We were going to an entirely another state to spend some time with some friends to do some things that we wanted to do. And we planned to leave immediately after my clinic visit. But the doctors came in. They looked at some of the current numbers from that day. I'm thankful for my team that always did that. They looked at live, real-time information almost instantaneously. That's how UAB rolls, uh, particularly the Kirkland Clinic where all that takes place. But they looked at the numbers and came in. And one of my doctors, Dr. Pambukin, uh, which was a lifesaver in so many occasions, she said, Jim, you're not going home today. We're going to put you in the hospital. You're not going home unless you get a transplant or obviously you don't make it. So that rocked my world. I thought hearing the word transplant associated with my name was a big deal. Nothing compared to this. My family at that point in time was already struggling. We already lived about an hour and 15 minutes from the transplant center, going to all the doctor's appointments, which had come down to about once a week were difficult. And now here we are, even though I've been hospitalized many times throughout those couple of years, I'm being told you are going to the hospital to stay. Now, my daughter at the time was 12 years old. My son was eight. Uh, extremely difficult, painful thing to consider that daddy's going in the hospital and he may not come home. Or if he comes home, who knows when that'll be? I'd already waited 10 months. I'd already been listed nearly at the highest tier possible for 10 months. How is this going to change anything? So I basically looked at my doctor, Dr. Pambuk, and I said, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, she said, well, you need to go in the hospital today. We can move you, hopefully move you up the status listing a little bit, get you to a 1A, you know, get the options for hearts coming in. I hadn't even got a call, not even a dry run in 10 months, nothing. Uh, we've got to get you in and we've got to take care of you because you've ran yourself into a corner. You're backed in the corner and, and you're struggling now. We don't know how long you have left without this. I said, no, I don't want to do that. Just just let me go home. Let me spend time with my family this weekend. We'll go on our trip. I'll be back in here Monday morning. I promise if you want to put me in the hospital, then then that'll be great. No, she wasn't hearing it. She said, you have got to be admitted today. We've got to get this process rolling. We've got to get, you know, your options made simpler and more available. You are not going home. I kept being adamant. Yes, I am going home. Finally, she pretty much got mad, walked out of the room, pushed the door to kind of hard, said, I'll be back in a little bit. You need to think about this. I called my wife and I was like, hey, here's what Dr. Pambukin saying. I told her that we were going to go ahead and go on our trip because it's been planned a while. I'll be back in here Monday. My wife said, what in the world? <laughs> what is wrong with you? If she says go in the hospital, you're going to the hospital. I said, no, I can't. You know, everybody's in school right now. It's just, it's just not worth it. My 12 year old was pretty close to graduating from uh, the fifth grade, which was kind of that transition, at least here from elementary to middle school. I wanted to be a part of that. And I just didn't want to do it. She said, you do what the doctor says. Don't even call me with some, I don't remember she said stupid, but that's what she meant. Don't even call me with any of these harebrained ideas. You're going to do what she says. So I hung up the phone with my wife, kind of frustrated. I then in turn called my friends, uh, those that were going to visit. And I was like, hey, I got a little bit of bad news. The doctor's kind of wanting to admit me to the hospital. But I told them I'd, I wanted to come spend time with y'all. I, you know, well, He said, no, forget it. You come first. You do what the doctors say, and he didn't want to hear it either. So I wasn't getting anybody to support my ideas, my opinion. It just wasn't working out for me. So Dr. Pambukin came back in the room, and, and once again, she said, okay, have you thought about it? I said, yeah, I've thought about it. I still, you know, really, I promise you, promise you, I will, I will be back here Monday morning bright and early. I'll be here before you get here. You can admit me then. Just let me go. She said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Mr. Merle. She said, you are on the transplant list. You're a status 1B. So you're just about the top of that list. Uh, you've got no calls whatsoever. Um, you're asking me to go out of town more than our four-hour threshold away from the transplant center, way off in another state. She said, i tell you what I'm going to do. You go ahead and do whatever you, you want to do. If you want to go out of town, go. 
But she said, I'm going to list you as a status seven, which is, if you're not familiar with that, status seven then is the same as it is now as the inactive status, which means you're not going to get any calls. If the call comes in, you blew it, <laughs> you weren't in range or something else had come up and you're going to miss it. You're going to miss out on hearts. And she said, then when you do show back up into town Monday, I'll, you know, I don't know if I'll leave you at status seven or not. You're going to have to prove to me that you want this transplant. So basically, if you want to go out of town, you're off the list. Your chances are done. And I had it in the back of my mind thinking, you know, I've always heard that being cooperative, being um, what is compliant with your with your team's request is extremely important. <laughs> you know, not being laid, labeled as an insubordinate was extremely important because I realized that my doctors, I'm not saying they were this way, they weren't that hardcore, but you know, I don't know. Uh, my doctors had the power to take me on the list and, and take me off or put me on the list and take me off. They had the power to treat me or not treat me and my refusal to cooperate could be the difference of non-compliance where I don't stand a chance. And so it could be life or death. I either do what Dr. Bambukin says, and I'm admitted today, or maybe I don't get that chance. So, of course, I had to give in, and I was admitted that day, and my weight really would come down to the last little bit. So 265 days, finally was admitted to the hospital to wait. So my wife, my family, they get together. They come over. Uh, you know, they, they, they meet me at the hospital, bring me some things. But that's it. I'm in the hospital. That was on May the 2nd of 2013. So May the 2nd. The doctors immediately did what they said they were going to do. They started working really hard to get me moved up that status list to try to get some, you know, some some offers to come in, for lack of better terms. And so they finally, on May the 7th, so May the 2nd to May the 7th, so five days later, they did get me moved up that status 1A. So I was at the top of the list. And my offers, uh, you know, at least the potential for an offer was there. So fast forward another week, May the 15th. So May the 2nd to May the 7th to May the 15th, May the 15th, 2013. I got my first offer and uh, they came in, said, Mr. Merle, you're MPO to further notice. I said, what does that mean? They said, it means we might have a heart for you. So I, I you know, I was all excited. I was very emotional on every, every part of it, but I was all excited thought this was it i called my friends i called my family i let everybody know you know there was a huge celebration my family plus you know 20 people probably total came over to the hospital throughout the day they keep coming in and saying things look good things look okay you know we're, we'll see how this goes this could be your heart I'm, I'm signing paperwork i'm as far as i know my gift has come this journey is about to, you know, have, I almost said to come to an end, but not to come to an end, but this journey is about to really begin and my opportunities are about to start. Turns out later that day, after about 10 to 12 hours, something like that, the nurse walked in and she really just cracked the door and she said, it's not yours. And that was a moment. That was another tremendously low moment. You know, my, my family, uh, they they convinced, committed to crying and, you know, wailing, I guess. And everybody was upset. My friends, uh, I still call them my friends, but my friends didn't know what to do. Most of them just said, I'm sorry. And they walked off and that was it. They left the hospital. You know, nobody knew what to do with that. After a little while of trying to deal with that and, and you know, all the emotion that was going on in myself and around me, I finally just said, look, everybody, please leave. Everybody, my family. My wife, my children, just go, just go. Give me some time. So they left. I made a real quick video that afternoon. I've been doing some videos already. Made a real quick video that afternoon. I'll link it up here. You can go back and watch it. Of what I finally had to come to, my mindset, what it had to be in order to survive this. But I didn't get that heart. Fast forward seven days later, one week later, April the 21st. So we got... Um, April 15th, this is April 21st slash 22nd. It's late on the 21st. They walk in that evening. It was around 7 o'clock-ish. Walk in that evening and gave me the same news. They said, you're in P.O. to further notice. There may be a heart. At that moment, the only way I could kind of deal with that was just to be in denial. I was kind of like, okay, so what? You know, I don't expect this to be it. Uh, the one last week wasn't it. Uh, I don't expect this to be it. It's, you know, this is just, this ain't going to happen. Uh, but I did decide after I laid there for a while, about an hour, 
<laughs> I decide, and I got in trouble for it too. After about an hour, I decided I better, you know, I probably better call my wife, better let my parents know, better let my children know that I'm at least there's a possibility. But when I let them, when I did get in touch with them, caught up with them finally, I just basically said, look, they told me they may have a potential heart. I wouldn't think too much of it. Don't worry about it. Of course, they're, they're saying, no, no, no. We're on the way. We're coming to the hospital. We're, we're leaving right now. I was like, no, seriously, it's not. This is probably not a big deal. It's just going to be down to the miss. I wasn't really, you know, that concerned about it. But they all showed up really fast, a lot faster than that hour drive. They all showed up really fast. And they were there to support me. And they were there, you know, to encourage me. And we waited throughout the night up until the next morning. Uh, which they had updated me a few times up until the next morning they said it's, it's yours it's a match they had gone to uh to receive the heart from oklahoma i knew that much didn't know anything else they'd gone to receive a heart from oklahoma and uh, they were taking me down to pre-op so 5 30 in the morning on the 23rd uh, i'm trying to get all these dates right i guess that was 22nd to 23rd my donor was involved in a fatal accident on the 21st late on the 21st so i know the dates get confusing but on the 21st he was involved in an accident um i didn't get the call till late on the 22nd and of course the 23rd i'm taking on a pre-op and uh you know gotten all ready took a ton of immunosuppressant drugs everybody was there uh it was such a difficult time till my wife um just the thought of everything she finally at one point just kind of leaned back up against the wall and then she slid down real slowly she she had really passed out thankfully it didn't fall on her face or anything but she'd really passed out from the stress but they took me in um surgery ultimately went smoothly they told my family it would be a 12 14 hour surgery so that's all what we had known the whole time and expected uh, they knew as a congenital patient that i'd probably be kind of difficult they thought there'd be a lot of scar tissue to deal with um, so they took me, took me on back into surgery and I told the story before I, I thought the whole time that, you know, I'd been terrified of the process really, to be honest. And many a nights I'd woke up in a cold sweat, you know, with a thought of actually rolling back to surgery. And I thought the whole time that as I went around each bend, UAB is a huge hospital system. As I went around each corner and each bend in each elevator and out on the way to the operating room, I always thought that, you know, I'll get so scared, I'll jump off the gurney and run off and tell them I'm good with what I have, served me well for what at that point was 38 years. I don't want it. But I didn't do that. There was a sense of peace. Uh, I realized that God had me in his hand and that, you know, he was going to care for me, that the, the doctors, the nurses, everybody was going to care for me, my family, they were going to love me and pray for me. And however this worked out, life or death, I was going to be in the better state and uh, my family were, were confident in that. So I went on into surgery. All I remember really about that was uh, they rolled me in on the gurney. The the room was, was so bright. I mean, just extremely bright around me because of all the lights. And I remember them saying, Mr. Merle, can you move over from here to the operating table? So I moved from my, my gurney with a nice cushy blanket on it over to the, you know, cold, uh, metal operating table. I remember that, and then that's it. I don't remember anything else. My family were sent back out to the waiting room. They hadn't gone in the operating room anyway, but from the pre-op area, they were sent back out to the waiting room. Uh, my wife, finally, she had been so exhausted and you know hungry and all, so she said, hey, it's going to be a long time. I'm going to go get a bite to eat. Um, this is after a period of time. Going to go get a bite to eat, and y'all hold down and everything. There were probably 20 people in the waiting room waiting for me. And the doctors came out and said, uh, we need to talk with his wife and family. And uh, they were all terrified because when they said that, it had only been about five to five and a half hours. Now, this is out of 12 to 14 hours. It's only been about five to four, five to five and a half hours. And here they are wanting to talk. So the, the ultimate assumption is he must have died. Something went wrong. Uh, it didn't work. It didn't take. So they were kind of mostly prepared for that. But the doctor came out and said he did awesome. That was it. Everything went smoothly. Um, there were not any scar tissue to deal with like we thought. There were no issue, no problems. Everything was a success. And so, you know, that that that's kind of my the, my middle story. You know, born a congenital heart patient, supported by a wonderful family of doctors, 
told I needed a transplant almost five, six years prior to the fact I get it. And there it is. It has come. So now it was time. And that's my next question. I always ask everybody, can you tell us a little bit about your recovery? My recovery was amazing, especially in the beginning. I had kept one thing in mind the whole time. I learned this years ago during one of those four heart transplant evaluations. I kept in mind the whole time that I need to keep my legs. No matter what, I needed to continue to walk, continue to do every ounce of exercise I possibly could in order to prepare my body for getting out of that hospital bed after transplant. So, and that's a key. I think that's a definite key to how well you do in your recovery is how well you can go in. As a matter of fact, the night I was waiting on that, the tw you know, long, long night before the, the surgery itself, I had been walking the halls. I'd walked two, three miles that day and continue to walk the halls almost all night uh, because I wanted to keep my legs. And that was a blessing because I come out of surgery. I'd been out of surgery for about 45 minutes or so. I was awake and at myself and I began to sign to my doctors to, you know, take the take the breathing tube out, take me off the ventilator, or whatever. I remember Dr. Pambukin standing over me. She was with a, a whole team of doctors and she said, No, no, Mr. Murrow, we don't want to do that because if we take that thing out and you can't breathe, we gotta put it back in. You need to remember we put it in you while you were asleep and it's it's gonna be horrible to put it in with you wide awake. I was convinced, no, 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 take it out, take it out, take it out. So 45 minutes, and this is a shocker. I've not met many. I've met a few, but not many that have been able to do this. This is my recovery story. 45 minutes after surgery, they pull my ventilator, my breathing tube, and I just started to talk. I kind of raised up in the bed a little bit, very uncomfortable and a lot of pain, raised up out of the bed a little bit and began to talk. And the rest was almost history. Uh, it was shortly after that, the next morning-ish, they got me out of bed, set me up in a chair. It was within that same day I got out and walked. Um, and I didn't just walk a step or two. I walked like 200-something feet. And by the end of that week, I was walking three to four miles a day. Okay. So my recovery was unbelievable in the beginning. Was it perfect? No. There were little issues like one of the... Uh, uh drain lines you know they they put in drain lines to, to drain fluids and, and stuff out of your body one of the drain lines that was in me uh, from surgery had gotten out of place and was literally somehow i can't imagine how this was really happening but was rubbing on my lung horrible pain horrible pain i was getting medications literally you know stuck into my uh, my swan gans in my neck um what is that called? Fentanyl. I was getting fentanyl shot directly in my neck for pain. Horrible. And a huge setback, really. I would have probably literally been out of the hospital or could have been out of the hospital in two to three days after transplant. But the pain was so horrible. Uh, they finally realized what was happening. They pulled the drain lines. And they weren't really necessary. I was doing great anyway. But, you know, my story is different. A lot of people, you know, they don't they don't get woke up for a couple to three days they don't get off the ventilator for a couple three days a week uh, they don't even close their chest if you didn't know this i'm sorry but some of you already do they don't even close the chest sometimes for the first 48 hours in case of bleeding my chest was closed my tubes were out you know i was doing great and i was hitting the floor running and i was so thrilled for that so my recovery hadn't been perfect since i've had several bumps in the road i had to have my aortic valve replaced a couple of years ago that was kind of difficult. You know, there have been ups and downs, and I always tell people there will be ups and downs. Every day will be a new day. Every day is a wonderful day, an opportunity at a day, but it's a new day, and things are sometimes different. But that, you know, that's kind of what things were like in my recovery. So next question, what has been the best and the worst thing about transplant for you? The best, obviously, is opportunity. Just having the chance to live. And this is where my family expansion started. <laughs> uh, a few years after transplant, my wife and I had been, you know, wanting more children, wanting to adopt. And we have. We've gone from two children to five children. We've adopted three little girls pretty much at birth. Uh, right now, my children's ages are 19, 15, 7, 6, and 5. So those three little ones there were, you know, just step stones, one after the other. Um, and, and, and things are wonderful. Uh, not perfect, but wonderful. I have a wonderful family now. 
I love my five children. I love my wife. My parents are still with us. And, you know, it's just been a tremendous thing and opportunity. I've seen so many things. I missed my daughter's fifth grade graduation. I left this out. The day of my transplant was her fifth grade graduation. I missed it. And I regret that. But I saw her graduate from high school, uh, middle school, then high school. I saw all these milestones take place in all my children's lives. You know, a couple have graduated from kindergarten and my son from from elementary school and middle school. I've seen all that in the eight years after my transplant. So it's opportunity. That's the best thing. The worst thing um, probably just has to be the unknowns. I mean, really. Uh, we live a life as an immune compromised people who, you know, we face some difficulties. I've had some things not heart related that, you know, knock me off my feet, that put me down hard. And I really, you know, I regret that I didn't know more about it then. And so that's why I've, you know, been doing this channel now for a couple of years like I have, because I want people to understand transplant. I want people to know what they're facing, what they're dealing with, what the op options are out there. And, you know, just, just go into the process, if you will, with eyes wide open. Go into the process knowing that there will be difficult days. And that's been the worst part about transplant because I think in the beginning, pre-transplant at least, I thought, well, you get a transplant, life will be hunky-dory and perfect and that'll be it. That's not it. <laughs> there will be some hard days, uh, very difficult days, but we face them nonetheless. So the last question I like to ask everybody is what piece of advice would you like to give someone who has just heard they need a transplant or maybe shortly thereafter? My piece of advice probably has changed a little bit through the years, but it continues to be the same. And that is just to remind people that even though a day might be a hard day, okay, some days may be horrible days, there are still days. And every moment you're given, whether that's pre-transplant or post, those moments are blessings. You know, I encounter a lot of people right now who are on the transplant list. Maybe you're one of them who are struggling. They're saying, well, you know, I've already waited, you know, I waited, 265 days somebody says i've already waited two years and i hadn't got a call yet it's horrible no no it's not because that's two years that you lived to not get a call okay every day is a day that counts and and that may be a hard day it may be a difficult day but if you live that day it counted and so even if you're waiting for transplant and you think it's never going to come a great friend of mine, Bailey Craig, Bailey was one of those people who, not heart, but lung transplant, waited for right at five years, literally on the list for five years, thought that day would never come. Very difficult time. I know she struggled. I struggled watching her struggle. But her gift came. And, and her gift came with all those years behind her. And every one of those days of survival, so many of you have a similar story. Post-transplant, same idea okay the days may not be perfect but they're still days there's still opportunities in life and what our duty to do for ourselves and for our family is just to make those days the best days they can be that's my advice now if that's if you're waiting or if you're shortly thereafter never 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 set the bar without some expectation don't set the bar too high don't don't set goals you you won't reach Set the bar right above the top of your head and reach for it every day. And as I always summarize it in these letters, K-O-K-O. -K -O, that means keep on keeping on. Make every day a gift. What a wonderful blessing it is. I know this has been rather long. All of these interviews have been long, so I guess mine's just the same. But I know this has been long, but I hope you've gained something from it. I hope that this shares with you, and I left out an awful lot, but I hope this shares with you enough of my story to allow you to understand where I've been from or come from, where I've been, and hopefully where I'm going in life because I plan to continue to succeed. Stay stronger, friends.